Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Arnie's. We are three inverted time agents with nothing better to do. I'm Austin Terry, and I'm joined by my best pals, Matt Johnson and Keith Baker. Matt, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing well. This is actually, I was thinking about this earlier, this is kind of an exciting episode because just with the timing that we started this podcast back in like late June, um, and of course with you know, COVID going on. We haven't really been able to talk about newer movies. Obviously, we did like a Star Wars deep dive series and we've talked about what we can. But this is our really this is our first big kind of new ish 2020 movie. So kind of excited to talk about it because I mean, there's a lot surrounding this movie and there's certainly a lot to talk about and a lot a lot to break down. So I'm excited. This is gonna be a fun recording. So Keith, got to bring you in as well. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Um, I think I might have told you guys before, I did not watch any trailers, did not read anything about this movie before going into it. So I came into it pretty blind, not knowing what it was about at all. Um, it confused the shit out of me. <laughs> I have no idea what was going on the entire time. Yeah. I do like time travel movies, even though this is kind of half time travel and half more just action. What the hell is going on chronologically? Can't really tell. Um, I think this discussion, I'm going to be asking a lot of questions to you guys. Hopefully, you guys can answer it, but maybe we'll you won't see. be able to. We'll see. We'll see. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think it's good you've got questions, Keith, because I think the whole world has questions about this movie. Um, audience members, welcome. We are, of course, discussing the new Christopher Nolan movie, Tenet, today. However, before we get into that movie discussion, guys, I think we've got a little bonus series going on at the moment that we've got to tell the audience about. That's right, Austin. We do have a bonus series still going on. We are still uh, currently reviewing The Mandalorian Season 2. Uh, we have one episode left now. Uh, the finale is coming up. But before before we get into the main podcast, Matthew... I hate this transition. I hate that I have to do this because you guys force me to do things that I don't want to. Look, we reviewed season two of The Boys. I get it. We called it The Boys Talking The Boys. Did it make sense? It certainly did. And then we got pigeonholed. You know, everybody was like, hey, when's the next Talking The Talking coming? And well, I was... For- well, hold on. What, hold what, on. What? Hold on. You pigeonholed yourself because you came up with the boys' title, and then you said, when we do a bonus series, we should keep that name. No. So then the only thing we could come up with is the current name for the Mandalorian bonus series, which is... Austin, wait a minute. Hold on. I never did that. Are you telling me that possibly a future version of me moving backwards with a weird (laughs) face mask on, trying to breathe actual oxygen, actually came up with the boys talking the boys? And now we're using that title for every podcast? I'm telling you that you've pigeonholed yourself and then you complain about it for eight weeks I'm straight. trying to blame my future self. <laughs> anyway, people, <laughs> regardless of whether it was past Matt or future Matt that came up with the actual title, yes, we are the Mandos talking to Lorian. And as Keith said, this is a big week. You know, the end of the year is here, which means everybody's trying to get all their TV, all their movies, everything they're trying to release. And the finale of The Mandalorian Season 2 comes out this Friday, which means you can expect our full review breakdown on Season 2 and the finale episode itself on Sunday. Well, the finale, of course, will be in the future, but let's stay in the present for now. Today, we'll be discussing what may be the most entertaining and confusing movie of the year. It's time to talk about the latest thriller from Christopher Nolan, Tenet. Due to COVID, of course, this movie was just released to streaming worldwide. Matt, we've got a little time travel spy saga epic on our hands. Give us some thoughts so we can get into it. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, I guess I was unlike Keith. I certainly saw a bunch of trailers for this movie. And I guess based on timing, I definitely saw trailers for this back when theaters were still a thing. I think the last movie I saw was like Birds of Prey or something back in February. Anyway, the point being, I was excited for this movie. As I've talked about in, I think, our overrated movies episode, I have I was such a big Chris Nolan fan. The Prestige, Memento, the Batman films, except Dark Knight Rises, um, are some of, like, are some of my favorite movies ever, and just, I think, are the best. And since 2012, The Dark Knight Rises, he's kind of been on just a personal, not, I'm not talking about him, I'm talking about just my thoughts, a, a kind of like a personal downhill trajectory. I, I certainly don't like Dark Knight Rises. I was a little bit disappointed with Interstellar. It did not hit me the way I had hoped. 
and Dunkirk similarly. I just, I, I thought it was so well made, but I just did not vibe with the story and characters. So I was really hoping that, you know, with Tenet, because those first trailers gave me such an Inception vibe, which was the last movie of his that I loved. And that was, you know, 10 years ago now, back in 2010. So I was hoping that um, I would feel the same way. And unfortunately, it, it kind of feels like his streak for me has continued. I think the filmmaking is exceptional. I think we have some amazing visuals, but it just seems like for whatever reason, over the years, he's decided to kind of disregard character relationships development in favor of just really fucking cool visuals and action sequences, which they certainly earn their place and they're important. But yeah, for me overall, it doesn't, it doesn't work so well whenever you make another two and a half hour movie and I'm supposed to care. So unfortunately this one was not a big hit for me. Keith, I'm going to come to you now. This movie, like we said, is on streaming. However, it is $20, which is a little bit more than what a movie ticket would cost you. So what do you think? 20 bucks, is this movie worth the price of admission? No. Non-spoiler, of course. <laughs> Spoiler and non-spoiler. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think I don't think it is. I mean, it had some cool concept in there, but to me, you know, after we after we broke down the uh, our soundtracks actually, it, it kind of brought this up. Christopher Nolan has a underlying theme with his movies with his soundtracks and the way they I guess, play along with the theme of the film. And I guess this was Hans Zimmer again, right? No. It's funny you say that, though, because I, I thought it was Hans Zimmer as well, but it's actually a different composer, and, and we'll, we'll get into that in a second. I don't know. Like, it relies heavily on the music behind every scene. Like, there's always, like, this, like, boom, yeah, like, yeah. this build up and all the songs behind it, and it which kind of keeps you up with the movie, and I get it, and it, I guess that's what makes it cool, but uh, it kind of, I don't know, it gets old after a while. After a few of his movies. I will say to that point, Keith, though, I am actually to the, to the real quick, I guess the whole question of is it cool to pay more money for watching movies like I guess now they're calling it premium movies, like brand new movies on streaming. I'm OK with it, because as you guys know, whenever we first became friends and saw movies, it was like way cheaper. But as time went on, we were paying probably at least 12 bucks, I want to say, per movie ticket. So to pay eight dollars more to watch it at home, I'm OK with that. But at the same time, just that's kind of that point. But to Keith's point, I am glad I kind of watched it streaming because didn't you guys hear about all of the audio issues that people were having in theaters where it was just like the score was so loud and the action was so loud and then characters you can barely hear them, which has been a pretty common complaint with Chris Nolan movies, especially in the last eight years. So I, I kind of am glad because I didn't have that issue watching it just at home personally. I, I'm kind of glad you brought that up, Matt, because at times I did find characters hard to hear in this movie. And I was thinking, I'm, I'm glad I'm not watching this in theaters because there's no way I'd be able to hear it in there. I know. <laughs> and when the action comes on, you're like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> I think for my, for me, though, just my quick non-spoiler thoughts, I think I might be a little bit higher on it than the two of you. I think it certainly has its issues and, and it is extremely confusing and hard to follow. Um, that being said, though, I still found it really entertaining and, and really fun to watch. So... I think especially, you know, the time period we're living in right now with, with everyone stuck at home, I think it definitely is worth 20 bucks to go ahead and check this movie out. Yeah, especially if you're able to watch it with friends or do like a watch party and you can all like throw in a couple bucks to watch it because at that point, I think you'll at least have fun, you know, with the visuals, the action and the performances I think are all, all around great. It's just, you know, we'll break down some of the issues we had, but I, I think it's worth it for the experience without a doubt. All right. So two out of three of us think it's worth it. We're now going to throw up our spoiler warning. Going forward, we will be uh, talking no holds barred, so we're, we're not going to worry about spoiling anything that has to do with Tenet. So if you haven't seen Tenet, we're begging you, turn us off here, or at least give us a pause, go watch Tenet, and then come back to hear the rest of our conversation. All right, so let's go ahead and run down our cast and crew here. This film is, of course, written and directed by Christopher Nolan. It is scored not by Hans Zimmer Keith, but by Ludwig Gornson. It stars John David Washington as the protagonist, Robert Pattinson as Neil, Elizabeth DeBecky as Kat, Dimply Capetia as Priya Sign, Aaron Taylor Johnson as Ives, and Kenneth Baran as Andre Sator. And of course, since this is a Nolan movie, there is definitely a cameo by Michael Caine. And it is just a cameo. 
Yeah, I would say for this movie, my or for the cast, my two favorite characters were John David Washington's character, the protagonist, and um, Kenneth Branagh's character, Andrea or Andre. <laughs> you just <laughs> I said idiot. Andrea. Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I gotta leave that in now. Yeah, you know what? I, I this might be my biggest positive for the movie. I'm looking through the cast as well. I don't think I can really. I don't really have a favorite now. Are there characters that are better than others? Sure. But the performances, I think, are all around really solid. I think John David Washington as the lead was great. I loved Robert Pattinson. Had like a really fun, just cool role. Sir Kenneth Branagh was obviously great. His Russian accent, is it good? Who gives a fuck? I had a fun time. He's great. Elizabeth Debicki, I thought, gave a really solid performance. I mean, everybody was really good in it. Um I just like I said, I think there are certain there are certainly characters that are better than others, but at the very least, the performances were solid all around. Let me just say on his Russian accent, I, I found myself laughing a couple times because there was points where he was talking where I actually couldn't tell he was talking because his lips were just like staying closed the entire time he was talking. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, is he saying something? <laughs> yeah, I I couldn't tell either. I mean, at times he just sounded like a Brit, like he actually is. And Aaron Taylor Johnson, another great actor who plays Ives, who's not in the movie that much. There, were, when he's introduced, he's like extremely British, and then the, towards the end, I was like, "Is he American in this scene?" <laughs> like, I I thought he was I thought he was Scottish. He was all over the place. <laughs> I mean, it was it was odd. So some of the accents were were a bit weird, but you know what? I I have fun with that kind of stuff, so it's all good. Like you said, I mean, the whole cast is great, Matt. John David Washington for sure is, is a standout oh, in the lead, but yeah. I, for me, man. This might be Robert Pattinson's best movie. I loved him every time he was on screen. And I got to say, I'm even more pumped for him to be the Batman now after this movie. Yeah, he was. He got he got to play. I know it's a simple word, but he was just fucking cool in this movie. He got the cool role, you know, like he was kind of the guy that knows way more than he's letting on. So he kind of just gets to be kind of a sly and fun and slick and. Yeah, he was a joy to watch, for sure. I had a I had a fun time with that. So let's go ahead and run down a quick little plot summary. Matt, give me your uh, little elevator pitch for the plot of this movie. I'm going to try. I don't know how this is going to turn out. <laughs> so let's hope everybody is on board and understands. So here we go. I think I've got it. So there's this CIA agent, right? And for some reason, they thought it'd be cool to just call him protagonist, which was really dumb as fuck, in my opinion. And he dies, and he joins an organization called Tenet. Wow. He learns of bullets, which are inverted with, you know, entropy, and that allows them to essentially travel backwards through time, right? And apparently, you can do this with anything, just so people know. So the Tenet scientists <laughs> are afraid that there is this weapon in the future that can wipe out the past. The weapon is essentially called the algorithm, and there is one piece missing that we need to find. So the protagonist and his new partner, Neil, begin tracking the bullets, and they end up finding this arms dealer named Sator that is involved. In doing so, they also recruit the help of his wife, Kat, who doesn't love him, wants to get away, so it's kind of this just perfect marriage of convenience, if you will. The protagonist offers to help Sator steal a case of plutonium, and during that heist, they discover they are stealing the final piece of the algorithm, actually. And afterwards, they are ambushed by Sator, but this time, he has inverted himself, right? So this leads us to... The second and third act where Kat reveals that Sator is dying and intends to take the entire world with him through the use of the algorithm since it is tied to him through a dead man switch. The tenant forces all converge and track down the algorithm and run a temporal pincer movement, which is a really cool title that they said a bunch, which always got me pumped, and they assault the bomb site. During the assault, Neil and the protagonist are able to retrieve the algorithm and disable it, which allows Kat to safely kill Sator and the protagonist at the end, realizes he is actually the future founder of Tenet. Whoa! I don't think I could have done it any better myself. Nice job on the plot summary. I didn't understand anything I said, but I loved every word. Well, let's just jump right in now. Let's get into our roundtable discussion. Who wants to kick us off today? All right, let's get into this. So it should be no surprise to anybody that this is is dense. I don't even know where to start, to be honest. I just feel like this is one of those weird instances where 
either I didn't follow most of the movie, or I have to watch it like 12 more times before I can actually understand it. And, you know, it's cool to reward multiple viewings with something, but for me, the primary goal is always to entertain, and it shouldn't be so dense and confusing that like you can at least pick up on most of the basics of what's going on on a first viewing. And I just felt too confused, I feel like, for a movie that's two and a half hours long, and because of that, I don't think I can give it a glowing review. Um, just for comparison with previous Nolan films, Memento and Inception are really child's play, I feel like, compared to this. Those took really basic plots or concepts, just like with Inception, it's just the concepts of dreams. Memento, it's just a pretty basic thriller plot. They just tell it backwards and kind of with different cuts that tie together in fun ways. And um, they did something really complex and layered with them, which is cool. Interstellar, for me, kind of cranked it up with a bit more of a tougher subject matter, since obviously not everyone knows everything there is to know about space and black holes and time, etc. <sighs> but Tenet takes the concept of inverted entropy and faux time travel and pairs it with a super, super complex and confusing spy plot, which, as we know, can be notoriously hard to follow just on their own. And on top of that, the characters also feel super subdued compared to other Nolan films. At least we really get time to delve into characters and their interpersonal relationships and stuff like Inception and Interstellar, which are certainly a bit more dense and confusing than others. And here, everyone just seemed a bit distanced from each other, and whenever they do try and put them together and advance their relationships, it didn't really work for me. So that's kind of where I'm at with this one. I think the only point I'm going to disagree with you on there is is your character's point. Um, I love the way the protagonist and Neil interact. I think those two play off of each other nicely. They don't have very much development to do throughout the movie, but I don't know that you really need that from their characters. Like, they're both just supposed to be these time-traveling spies, basically. Um the relationship between the protagonist and Kat is a little bit harder because I don't think they're supposed to be like in love at the end of the movie, but I think they're at least supposed to care about each other enough that they're willing to make some hesitations on their missions. Um, so I, I mean, I just, I think everybody here gives a great performance, and maybe I'm tying that too much with the characters themselves. But I, I found all the characters here really interesting and compelling. I did too. I thought all the characters and all the actors played them uh, great. I just was confused with the story. The story just. I just was not following it from the beginning. I think maybe I'd need to go back and, like you said, man, I think it might have to be like a 10-time watcher for me to really get what's going on. I think for this movie, I think they need to have a disclaimer at the beginning that subtitles are a must. Because my, my wife and I were watching it together, and halfway through, we were both like super confused. We weren't following what anybody was saying or where the plot was going. And then we turned on subtitles, and that made a huge difference because you could actually read what they were trying to tell you, and I felt like it was way easier to understand the characters, too. Well, yeah, you're braver than I am, because I, I watched the whole thing with subtitles, and I still didn't really understand <laughs> what was going on. <laughs> I think, um, since we're in spoiler territory, we can talk about it, but yeah, I, I liked the protagonist and Neil, I don't know, you know what you'd call it, interplay, I guess, as well. The problem is, at the end, they reveal that for Neil... Like, the protagonist is his best friend, basically. But for him, they've been best friends for years, and now he has to go off and die based on how the third act resolved. Whereas the protagonist, he hasn't founded Tenet yet. He hasn't recruited Neil. So they still have, as Neil puts it, like, a bunch of shit to kind of get into, essentially. So since the protagonist is our protagonist, and it's through his eyes, it's kind of like they have some cool moments where it's like, Hey, man, you lied to me again. And then Neil's like, sorry, mate. And he's like, yeah, you're pretty cool, though. That was a funny joke you just said. And he's like, totally. And then they just do like a high five. And it's like, okay, that was fun, I guess. <laughs> but it's like, I wish there was more. But then at the end, it's like, okay, I get why there's not more. But then maybe should they have written the end a different way? I don't, I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I think once you know that for Neil... Like, this is his best friend. I think it kind of makes you enjoy Robert Pattinson's and just Neil's character overall more throughout the movie. Because for him, he's hanging out with his best friend. So that's kind of why he is the way he is around him. Right. But it's like, I feel like I will probably only appreciate that once I go back and watch it. And since now it's like I'm trying to remember all those moments and it's like, 
yeah, he now I can remember it having watched it once and they're best friends. So I can think about all those previous scenes. It must be cool for him to like meet him previously to the one he had in his own timeline. So, yeah, it's just, you know, it's it's still kind of hard without going back yet. So I have a question for you guys, because the second this movie finished, I went back and rewatched the opening sequence because I was so confused why that was in this movie. Um, and I didn't pick it, pick up on it on the first time. But did you realize the whole sequence with the opera scene is a test to get into Tenet? I did because they said it was, but still I thought they were not telling the truth because it doesn't seem like a test. And they kill his entire team. So his entire team dies and then he gets captured and tortured. They take the artifact and then he is, is able to swallow this capsule that will essentially – it's cyanide, so it will kill him. And then they have an amazing title drop, by the way, wherever Tenet pops up as he's basically choking on yeah. cyanide. And um, then he wakes up and there's this guy that's like, welcome to the afterlife. It was just a test. We've rebuilt your mouth because you bit on cyanide. But don't worry. You passed the test. And then the protagonist is like, oh, OK, cool. So did my team get out? Like, where are they at? And they're like, oh, no, nah, they're all dead. It's like, what? Well, to your point, Austin, it's like, so were the guys that were torturing him? part of Tenet and they killed the people? I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know. Because there's so many reveals in this movie, like, <laughs> you caught on. I'm part of Tenet. And then, like, five minutes later, Robert Pattinson's like, I'm part of Tenet. And then he meets up with the arms dealer that is probably kill responsible for the murders of millions of people in India. She's like, <laughs> I'm part of Tenet, pal. And it's like, <laughs> we're best friends. So it's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if those people that were torturing them and killed their team are part of Tenet that were testing him, like for a job or... And at the same time, if he's the founder, that means he set this test up for himself. Exactly. That's what also gets tricky. The only thing to your point, original point, Austin, that I picked up on in the beginning, like I'm sure most would, is that the person that saves him has the little key thing. I guess a future version of Robert Pattinson because he's wearing a full mask, but he has that red little chain thing. So it's all one big time. That's the problem, thing. though, Keith. And we're going to get into the Yeah, we're going to get into that more. I don't understand it because this movie, like I say, is not time travel. You can move backwards and they show that in the third act Like they move back several days to get to where um, to get to Vietnam, where Kat and. Andre are having their final confrontation, supposedly. The question is, is an old man version of Neil traveling back like just years at a time in real time to save his friend? I don't understand it. They don't show his face. I don't understand how that plays out because we see him in in, in moving forward time so many times in the movie. And then they reveal at the end that at least twice he was secretly moving backwards through time to save the protagonist. I don't know when he was doing it or when he was coming from. And it's just so confusing in a bad way for me. Well, I, I think it's good we're all confused because that does, that does kind of take us into my next point. As we've, as we've stated, this is a super, super jumbled and confusing movie. Um, at the same time, though, like I said, I do think it is extremely entertaining. Like It has some really, really cool visuals, um, especially the way they use like the inverted soldiers fighting the verted soldiers and just the way some of the fight sequence plays out and the way they use the bullets and entry. It's all really, really cool and really fun to watch. Um, obviously, Nolan is known for making stylistic movies uh, paired with intense subject matter. So what do we think? Does the quality of the filmmaking outweigh the confusingness of the plot here? I always, I always try and point out the way Austin words things because he's very careful with his words. I think if you had made that very general, that would be a more interesting conversation. Like, can the quality of filmmaking outweigh... Well, let's talk about it with Tenet, and then we can talk about it in general. Yeah, no, exactly. My point is, like, something like 300, hell yeah, the quality of the filmmaking is way more badass than everything else going on. But in Tenet, for me now, I think the quality of the filmmaking is certainly impressive. The amount that is clearly done practically or just with limited digital effects is really cool, but 
Yeah, yeah. I guess for me, it's it's also tough when you when you compare it to previous Nolan movies because he has done similar stuff with amazing fucking characters that have really fun relationships and great interplay. And here for me, that was mostly not completely, but mostly non-existent. So yeah, for me, this one, the quality of it does not outweigh the confusingness because again, it's two and a half hours long. So while there are some sequences that are so fun and just a joy to watch, there is so much movie outside of that. That is just kind of nonsensical. And by, even by the end, the payoff is kind of like, Huh? How did that work? I don't know. I should know, but I don't. So yeah, to answer your question, for me personally, it does not outweigh it. Yeah, I'm in in full agreement with you, Matthew. If you compare it to like Inception, Inception pretty much does the same visual effects. Yeah, a lot of them. A lot of them. Yeah, and if not more uh, in some scenes, and at least it explains the story better. And I think the character is a little bit, you know, more in depth. And at the end, you do get some sort of twist where you're like, you could be like, oh, what's what what happened? You know, right. when he when he exactly. twists the top and all that. So you can't you can't get a bit of confusion there, but at least you kind of know the main the main uh, structure of how the the whole dream sequence thing works. This is just you don't even know how the old inverted thing works. And you know what, Keith? To that point, that we're talking about it, you know what is such a simple thing in Inception that they did is. Not all of the characters, but almost all of the characters had a long history with each other. Like, we don't see their origin of when they met, but DiCaprio, um, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Tom Hardy, um, all these characters have a long history. So you can have scenes like, oh, hey, man, it's been years. How are you? And then you can see their interplay. And it's like, you don't need to do all this introductory stuff. Whereas here, I get why somebody like Nolan was like, I don't want to do that again. But I feel like in this movie, it might have worked better if they had, if some of these characters like Ives, Neil, Cat, the protagonist, had at least some kind of history. Maybe they don't, they're not best friends, but just something. Because, like, it's tough for the audience when our protagonist doesn't know what's going on, as opposed to Inception, where Dom, played by DiCaprio, is, like, the master of dream heists. So it's like, we're kind of along for the ride, and we kind of get it more because he gets it so well. Whereas our protagonist here is just like, huh? I don't understand any of what's happening. I for sure agree with that, because I didn't even realize that Ives and Neil had a relationship before like when they met for the first time you know like and i also didn't realize that ives and the rest of his squadron are also all tenant forces they don't do a good job of it like all these people i it seems like they've all been working together for a while but they don't do a good job of establishing that yeah as for the question of the quality of the filmmaking outweighing the confusingness of the plot i'm a little torn on my answer here because it's two and a half hours and it flew by for me. Like I did have a really fun time watching this movie. And while I don't understand the way they're trying to explain everything in this movie, I still enjoyed the way all the characters and actors like say their lines and play their characters. And I think the visuals are great here too. So I think because it is so confusing and hard to follow, it might turn off a lot of people, but I still think it is a really fun movie and really enjoyable as well. Despite some of its shortcomings with explaining the story overall. Yeah, it's definitely entertaining. And I definitely do want to rewatch it at least. And especially like we've mentioned before, because it was so confusing i want to see if i can pick up on some things i didn't catch the first time i think this is definitely a movie that's going to get better with more rewatches i hope so i hope so because a lot of his movies do um but this one was my like one of my least favorites in terms of the first watch i'm just really hoping with further watches i'm once i kind of grasp the story more and the characters maybe i will appreciate it more and that is my hope doing this initial review it's like you know who's to say but you know we'll see we'll see um and and i will say despite kind of my more negative outlook. I was not really, um, you know, moving my cursor a lot and moving my controller a lot to see how much time was left. You know, while it did feel long, um, it, 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 you know, I was engaged enough to be like kind of along for the ride and engaged enough to be like, okay, what's happening and trying to figure it out that it didn't feel like two and a half hours, which is certainly a compliment because as you guys know once we pass that two hour mark for a lot of people myself included it's like all right you really got to sell me on why all these scenes are in here because that's a lot that's a lot of time for a movie (laughs) and i was even rewinding at portions i did too stuff and it still felt like it went by fast yeah i rewound a couple of times just to be like wait what i need to i need to hear that one more time so yeah yeah it was two and a half hours but probably took me three like fully to get through so i will say 
For the first hour of this movie, I was a little bit like, okay, where is this going? And then the third act, like skip ahead there. And I was like, okay, I don't know if I love where this went. But there was this beautiful moment in the middle there where like halfway through the movie, obviously everything is kind of moving forward. But then the entire concept is turned on its head in a really smart way because it uses everything they've introduced. So this is the point. The point I'm talking about is when we reach the quote unquote present chronologically and then in order to save Cat and hopefully stop Sator, the protagonist essentially inverts himself. And so now we get to see him move backwards through time and through the movie that we've watched up until this point. So basically Along with Cat, because she's been right. shot with an inverted bullet. So she's so they're trying to now vert the wound. Right, that will save that her. That way it's that way it's just a normal wound. Because if, if she goes into the past, then it's it's a normal path for the gunshot. Wound. Right. And Neil jumps along at certain parts of this. So this basically takes us back through the events of the first hour of the film, leading to the airplane scene again, which was cool that they were able to save reveals like when... So cool. At the beginning, I was like, why the fuck is Neil here? And why isn't the protagonist calling him out whenever... Because Priya tells the protagonist, oh, you guys fought somebody moving forward and in reverse. That was the same person. And Neil told the protagonist before that that he let the guy... that He took care of him. So clearly he didn't. So this gives us a really cool reveal where, oh, the person that was both inverted and moving in reverse they were fighting was the protagonist from the future moving backwards. So it saved cool moments like that. And Neil knew what was going on whenever he saw him. And such a cool sequence of events, too, when you see it from the protagonist's point yeah, of view. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And on top of that, the action I felt was a little bit lame the first time around in the airplane scene whenever they're fighting. I was like, this looks weird because it looks like the punches aren't connecting in the right way. They're too slow. And it's because the opponent is the one that's inverse. So now, later in the movie... Now that our, you know, protagonist is the one moving forward, of course, you know, backwards through time. Now the action looks way cooler. It's not just like flipping around really fast, and like looking ridiculous. It, it, it's actually fighting now. And on that note, though, too, I like that when you see it from the inverted point of view, you can see that the protagonist is actually trying to pull his punches, too. Right. Like he's not yeah. full on swinging. And you also because the first time you see the gun sequence, that's when I was like, this looks so weird. Yeah. Um, and but then when, when you see him do it, you can tell he's purposely aiming the gun away from his head, mm -hmm. which I thought was really cool, too. Yeah, exactly. And also there's this whole thing where it's like. I guess he can't have bodily or like skin contact with his past self for some, you know, of course, time travel reason. So he's like fully in like body armor and all that stuff. So it's kind of this fun little thing. Um, yeah. And then obviously this entire second act concept continues into the third act where there's forward and backward moving tenant forces fighting this big war that takes place in the past events of the movie that we're actually watching. So this was my favorite part of the, the favorite aspect of the movie was that about halfway through, we actually get to revisit everything we've seen so far and how it kind of changes that dynamic of characters, action, and all this fun stuff. So I want to get your guys' thoughts and just, you know, what were you thinking with all that good stuff? God, it was so confusing. Like everything y'all just said, <laughs> I did not even catch. I'm like, what? <laughs> What are y'all talking well, about? Like, I didn't what, catch Keith, any ask, of that. ask us questions. Maybe we can help. Maybe not, but maybe we can. Yeah. So I didn't even know. So he was fighting himself at that moment during that fist yeah. fight. Yeah. I didn't even yeah. catch that. I thought he was just fighting one of the soldiers. I didn't even know that mm -hmm. was him. Yeah. Okay. I didn't catch that. <laughs> the other thing that was confusing was Sater's character. So there's the moment where he shoots a cat. They see another one of him. So, okay. So. They're in two different bodies, right? They're not the same physical form, right? So they're two. Right. You have a past self and a future self, and they're both passing. Yeah, because they, well, they're looking at each other on on either side of that window. So anytime they go through one of these turnstiles, which essentially is a time travel machine, yeah. you have to see yourself on the other side also coming in. Right. I think that means that's how you know you can exit. I yeah, believe. I got was, that. Um, so he's watching himself. Weird. He's watching when he's inverted. He's watching his present self. And when he's verded, he's watching its past self. I mean, it's crazy to even it's crazy to even say this, but basically it's like the fact that you can see yourself means, oh fuck, I guess I need to get inside the turnstile. It's real it's a really weird mechanic, like even with action. I do kind of like the way it's used though. I guess I did. I love when you see Neil's point of view during the final battle. Yeah. Because he realizes awesome. something is off. Of it. And he runs to the turnstile. And he can see himself coming out of it. So he's like, oh, I guess I need to get in here. To, to There's something I have to do 
on the verted side of things. Yeah. So or on the inverted side of things. So I need to fix this. Because right? like I thought that yeah, was cool. John David Washington is basically he's running through for action purposes trying to just it's kind of hard to say what his actual goal was. He just knew he had to be there. Whereas um uh Robert Pattinson's goal is like I have to save cat. I have to get her back through the turnstile. So he's like going through. And it's like, oh shit, there's me. I guess I have to go through here as well, which kind of mirrors the earlier thing in the movie where he's uh with John David Washington the first time they go through this whole art house, art warehouse, whatever sequence at the air at the airport. So definitely yeah. cool. Certainly, I didn't understand all of it either. Like I don't know why they have to go through the turnstile again. I didn't fully get that, but you know, it, it was still it made, interesting. It made the most sense. Know to me during the car chase scene that's when it really like kind of clicked for me whenever he was in the car driving backwards to his other self that was driving forward i still don't understand how sarah ended up with the final piece to the algorithm though because wasn't it in his car that he's driving in reverse okay i didn't understand this either and i read the wiki so i think the first time we see the scene it looks like the protagonist is passing the orange box to say to her, and it's like what the fuck is he doing um, and it's like, okay, great. He did it, I guess. Then later, after he's moving back through time, and I agree with Keith, that to me, this was the best use of it because it's like, okay, he has to specifically go back to find out information, which he can do because it just happened. See, I thought this was the worst use because oh. I sound, I, I just found this whole sequence of events so confusing. Definitely was confusing. It definitely was confusing. So all I kind of gra- gathered and then like reading a little bit is he finds the box, right? And it's empty. So it's like, yeah. okay, why is the box empty? And then he gets in the car at some point and he's driving. And then the, the little uh, plutonium thing is flying around. In his car. Yeah. So the implication to me was that original protagonist passed Sator the orange box, but he had taken the plutonium out. And I don't know if we saw that the first time as the audience. And he passes him the box, I guess, just to buy time. And then later they open the box like, shit, nothing's in here. They just toss it out the window. So then inverted protagonist can find the box. Oh, it's empty. And then eventually they end up with the plutonium thing through the car. And then, of course, the car that inverted protagonist is driving is the one that (laughs) inverted Sator crashes in and causes him to crash. And that's when it almost kills original protagonist whenever they're driving originally like oh shit there's a car crashing at us and that's our, and our inverted protagonist is in that one and he mm-hmm. almost dies via fire and ice in that scene yeah because when you're inverted <laughs> fire adds cold effects, which seemed like just effects. a dumb thing to add i get what they were going for but it just seemed like like robert pattinson's like you know when you're inverted and you could die by fire you actually die of hypothermia and it's like <laughs> That seems like a stretch. <laughs> like, but what about, what about the oxygen thing? Why can't they breathe inverted? Whenever you're inverted, apparently, you still need normal oxygen. No, it's the direction of air that your lungs are breathing. So when you're inverted, your lungs are breathing in a different way. Aren't they still breathing in and out, though? <laughs> I mean, it's still the same way. But I, I think I think the air particles are flowing differently when you're on that side of things. <laughs> you're, you're on Screw that this side movie, of man. I wish like we could ask Christopher Nolan a question. Hey, um, Christopher, whenever they wear the face mask, is that because they're on the other side of things? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, what the fuck? I don't know a different way to describe about? it, dude. I have no idea. I'm not going to pretend to... Uh, fuck, I, I don't know. <laughs> I had no idea why they even had those on. I thought that one point they said, oh, you need normal oxygen, so you have to have this. But I still didn't understand it. So when you get to the bomb defusing scenes with the whole army and all the other uh, Air Force dudes, whatever. So I guess half of them are inverted and half of them aren't inverted. Red team is moving forward, which is Ives and the protagonist. And blue team, which is Wheeler and Neil, are inverted. So they have the masks on and... It's basically they're they're all they're they're you know the pincer movement so they're flanking at the same time with the, the, the this movie one's moving forward one's inverted and there's a ten minute timer and they're doing shit at the same time and I don't know I don't know I'm so confused <laughs> and let's just even get more confused here who are they fighting in this scene 
Do you guys know? No. And where, when and where <laughs> are they fighting? I'm guessing it was uh, Sator's people that set up the bomb. Does he have that many people? I don't know. That, that was, I was trying to figure that out the entire movie. Like, who is working for this guy? When and where is this fight taking place? Is it in, is it in the future? Is it in the past? I don't under, I don't get it. I don't get it. It's in no time, Austin. I love the way it plays out. I think it's so cool. But I don't understand anything else about the fight. No, actually, now that I think about it, I don't know where this took place. I know it takes place in northern Siberia because that's where Sator was from and that's how this whole thing got started i guess this is in the past at least in terms of before the event started and then there's a whole separate action going on where cat traveled back even further to go to vietnam on this vacation with sator where he where future sator has inverted from even further and he's going to kill himself because he's dying and he's going to kill himself and basically destroy the world in the process on this day so, yeah, there's a lot going on here. You also don't see who they're shooting at. Yeah, well, really, the, I feel like one of the only few we see is one of the henchmen that was with Sator earlier. But he didn't have a huge yeah. group. Like you said, it was just a small group. And he was the one that set up the tripwire that Ives and protagonists set off in that little um, hallway. The other thing I want to bring up is is there certainly is quite a bit of exposition and characters basically just staring at the camera trying to explain things to you. In Nolan Newby's for me at least usually there's a point in the story where everything clicks in a way that's really satisfying especially like around the third act and i kept waiting for that to happen like even though i was confused in the first two acts i was like it's okay it's a nolan movie at some point it's all gonna make sense and i just never really had that aha moment in this movie what about you guys did you get that same satisfaction or or are you on the same page as me i I think they tried multiple times but i just don't think they nailed it because it was always like shrouded in dumb shit like whenever it's like revealed Oh wow, our main villain Sator is um he is going to kill himself, which will set off the dead man switch, which will destroy the world. And it's basically the follow up to one line from earlier when he was like <laughs> he's like, If I can't have you, then no one will And so it's like then they somehow connect that If I can't have you, then the world dies. And it's like, okay. So it's all this dumb shit, dude, where it's like, it's so elementary for me, where it's like, wow, cool. Kenneth Branagh's character, our main villain, is sad that he's dying of cancer. So his response is to destroy the entire world in the process. (laughs) It's not even like a 90s villain, like, I'm going to take over the world. It's like, he's literally going to blow up the world. (laughs) Yeah, his his motivations, I think, are the worst part of this movie for me. has a line where the character is like, why the fuck did you have a kid if that was your plan? And he was like, the bravest thing I ever did was bring a child into the world that I knew was going to end. No, that's not what he said. He said the greatest sin I ever did. The greatest sin I ever did was try to bring a child into the world that I knew was going to end. I guess I should have turned on subtitles here, right? Because I was like, what the fuck is he talking about? Either way, that's the end of the line, and it's stupid. It's stupid. Oh, God. Uh, so speaking of that third act, there is eventually a moment, like we've said, where Neil reveals that him and the protagonist are actually best friends that have known each other for Neil for a lifetime, for for, for the protagonist. It's a very short uh, period of time due to his point of view. And we also find out that the protagonist also is the founder of Tenet. When we got to this point, I felt like we had quite a bit more movie left to watch. So for me, when the when the movie ended, I was honestly really unsatisfying with the end. There was a lot that I still wanted to see. Yeah, why didn't they just start with that? Why didn't they just start with him, them kind of establishing the whole relationship with Neil and him being the founder of Tenet? Because then you don't really get a time travel movie. It still didn't even feel like he was the founder of Tenet at the end. He kills the two characters and then it's like, it just ends. How could he be the founder of Tenet if he was the one who was chosen by Tenet to be a Tenet? How I don't can get a tenant it. chuck tenant if a tenant could couldn't chuck tenant? <laughs> <laughs> That's how I felt watching this, so like I didn't understand the ending at all, like I said. I don't understand how he becomes the founder of Tenant. I don't understand when he recruits Neil. I don't understand how they become best friends. And I don't understand how a young looking Neil, after years of being friends, going to sacrifice himself by going back in time to get shot in the head in front of a gate that the protagonist can then open and stop the bomb from going off like i don't know i i don't get it to your point austin it felt like there should have been more in terms of like 
definitively when did Tenet start and how did he how was he involved? But at the same time, I was so glad that credits rolled when they did because I was done after two and a half hours. See, I wasn't, dude. I I am really interested in this world. I I want to see the founding of Tenet. I want to see why the future is waging a war on the past. Like, I kind of want a sequel or, or a prequel. A tune it. A tune it. Apparently something I read online is that the future is waging war on the past because of climate change. Did y'all get that at all? I mean, that's a decent reason. I just didn't get that in this movie. I mean, did they say that? That's the reason they want to blow up the world? They're not trying to blow up the world. They're trying to invert the past, which will then cause the future and the past to collide. And what they're hoping with the grad, the grandfather paradox is that It'll somehow improve the future. Maybe you're, maybe you're, God, I don't know. Maybe you're right. But too much of the plots focus on stopping a guy that's just like, <laughs> I'm going to destroy the world. So it's like, I don't, we didn't have enough time to develop the whole, like, what tenant's goal is and how the hell they're going to achieve it by going backwards in time and all that. I don't know. Yeah, they created the bomb in the future in order to invert the past but it wouldn't work because the past would collide with the future which makes sense to me but but that their overall goal no no they they want the past to collide with the future oh they do that's how the past gets wiped out oh yeah. okay the whole the sole purpose of tenant from what i understand is just to try and stop this bomb from going off it's tenant versus the future yeah i don't really care about any of this um i didn't get it <laughs> I apparently I got it even less than I thought. Or I, or I'm totally wrong, and everyone listening right now is. You're screaming probably right. It films. sounds right. I mean, it sounds right, but I don't know what that fucking means when they want to stop the past from colliding with the future. And it's like, what? I don't. Okay, maybe, sure. I don't know what that means when it goes forward. Well, if you invert the, isn't the opposite of the past the future? Whoa. So if you're inverting, right? I don't. So if you're inverting the past, you. I don't the know. Future. Whatever. Yeah. Well, you know, no, the problem, right. though, Austin, is you have to think, yeah, sure, the opposite of the past is the future, but this is not time travel. There's no straight lines like this. Like, you have to apparently just, like, if you want to go, if you want to time, tra- quote unquote, time travel in the world of Tenet, you have to take a week, like a full week. If you want to go back a week, you got to, you have to take a week to just put on your little mask and then go back. Let time play backwards a week and then whatever. So it's like the people that were trying to stop this bomb from going off, who knows how far in the future they came from? How long were they going backwards? I don't know. How old was Neil when he eventually sacrifices himself during the third act and dies? I don't know. So I'm confused. Okay. So it sounds like that. I think the best, the one word we can use to sum up this film is confusing. What do you guys think? Would you want? Are you on the same page as me? Do you want a Tenet two or a Tenet prequel? Do you want to know more about this world, or do you just never want to see this world again? Well, I feel like a prequel would also be a sequel, since it's all inverted in and everything else. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't want a prequel. I mean, I guess maybe a sequel because weirdly, a sequel to this movie would probably give us some of the origins of the important stuff, like the actual organization Tenet. That's why I said prequel. Right, so it's like a weird thing where they're kind of the same, but it's like a a, a direct sequel to this movie would tell us how the protagonist starts Tenet, I guess, and how he recruits Neil, I guess, and then maybe actually ends with a Neil we care more about sacrificing himself. And it's like, oh, wow, that's actually interesting. And maybe we actually understand more of how they operate, what their like what their actual goal is and how they're enacting it day to day. So that could be interesting. But also just on you know the flip side, if we never get anything else, which is what I assume will happen, I'm totally fine with that just because... You know, I I didn't I certainly didn't love this movie. I had a fun enough time watching it. I was confused for a lot of it. I probably need to give it at least one more watch at some point to see if I understand it better. But if you if we never get any more in this world, you know, I don't care. It's, it's similar with Inception. I mean, we heard for years after Inception, oh, there's gonna be there's gonna be a sequel, a spinoff movie with um Joseph Gordon Levitt and Tom Hardy's characters doing their own mission. I was like, like that was talked about for years. And it's like, oh, that'd be cool. So like, I feel like a lot of Nolan stuff is like, there's talks and then we'll get something. But um, so I I wouldn't be surprised if like over the next year or so, maybe we hear about a potential spinoff or sequel that we never get. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see if we get it. And if the action's cool and the visuals are dope, I'll watch it. But I'm not holding my breath because I didn't love this one. So we'll see. 
Yeah, I kind of am holding my breath. I, I really thought this was a cool, interesting movie. Certainly confusing, but I do think Nolan established a pretty interesting world that I want to learn more about. So I would definitely love to see a sequel. You know what? Speaking of holding your breath, you know what actually the best scene of this movie was? It was the art heist whenever they were holding their breaths during when the gas was coming in and then they were lock picking the doors cool. and then like <gasps> taking breaths in the hallways and then lock picking the doors and then taking more breaths. I was like, oh, this is really cool. That was the best movie got for me. Nolan loves his heist, man. I think he does a heist in every movie almost. I think you might be right. All right. Well, we got to get out of here. So, of course, we need to do the Arnie's Podcast Awards. If you're new this week, this is a segment where we give an award for anything in this episode. Keith, he may know the rules this week. He may not. Keith, go ahead and start us off today. My award goes to two people from this movie. Um, it is the Harry Potter Callback Award. It goes to uh, Kim Brano. He played Gidry Lockhart. Well, he played Gilderoy Lockhart. Gildry or Gil... Gildroy. <laughs> G- Gildroy. <laughs> he, he played Gildory Lockhart, and it also goes to Robert Pattinson, who played Cedric Diggory there you in go. The Goblet of the Fire. Nice call, Keith. Nice call. Austin, do you have any pressing awards you want to give out? I do, and, and my award this week is actually for an impressionist. Oh. I'm going to give the best Hans Zimmer impression to Ludwig Gornson, because Keith and I both thought Hans Zimmer <laughs> scored this movie, and we were shocked to learn it was not him. That's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. Matt, go ahead and close us out today. What do you got for us? So my award today is going to go for the most unnecessary plane crash. Now look, I love practical effects. I love Dark Knight Rises. They open and get to see that plane flying and Bane take it over, break the wings. They catch all that fun stuff. Did we really need to see like an actual plane just like slowly crash (laughs) into a hangar? Was that that cool to anybody? I don't know. Maybe it was. I thought it was pretty sweet. Well, there you go. I liked it. There you go. Austin thinks it was pretty sweet. But for me, I think, you know what? Put that plane in the air. You know what I'm saying? Let's get it in the air. Instead, it just slowly runs into a building. And that, for me, deserves the most unnecessary slash lame plane crash award. All righty. Well, everybody, that's going to do it for us today. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss any of our upcoming content. Also, if you wouldn't mind sharing us with a friend, that really is the best way to help us to continue to grow the show. At The Arnie's is our social, and the TheArnie's.media is the website. We'll be back on Tuesday for a bracket to decide the best holiday movie. All right, guys. Like I mentioned at the top, we are at the official end of the year our first year for the Arnie. So it's fun stuff. Like Austin mentioned, we have our amazing holiday bracket episode. What is the best holiday movie? Fair question. As we talked about, we also have the Mandalorian season two finale review coming soon. We're going to be before the year ends. We also have a review of Wonder Woman 1984 coming. And I think this is the first time we're talking about it. On the 31st, AKA the last day of the year, we will have the Arn Academy Awards, the first annual. We will be talking about what content deserves an award and what might not deserve an award. We'll see what happens. Either way, it's going to be a fun time. Only a few episodes left this year, so keep an eye out. Yeah, so check us out on Instagram. Feel free to direct message us your thoughts on this episode and our upcoming episodes. we got the best holiday movie bracket coming up, so send us any movies you think should have made the list, or if you agree with any of the movies that did make the list. Someone explain Tenet to us as well. Yes. Tenet! Give us a message. Tenet, explain it to us. I don't understand. Please give us when your thoughts on When does Neil kill himself? Tell us if you got it, if you know all the pieces to the puzzle, because I sure don't. Tell me if I was wrong, too, because I thought I had it figured I will out, say, but maybe not. You know what? Actually, I have a secondary award. My secondary award today is going to go to Austin for the most realistic but potentially wrong explanation of tenant that i have heard <laughs> i i gotta be honest everything he could have said could be without a doubt completely wrong but it sounded so convincing that i believe it keith whenever he talked about the past colliding with the future being like what they're fighting against, i was like oh fuck that sounds pretty cool now did i understand it no but let's hope he's right because it sounds cool okay well i'm happy i got an award but i think we gotta get out of here so we'll see you on sunday for the mandalorian and of course on tuesday for our holiday bracket Bye, everybody. See you. Bye, everybody. Don't watch HBO Max. Christopher Nolan doesn't want you to. Yeah.